Hello, everyone, and good evening. My name is Taryn Urquhart, and I'm the Arts and Special Events Programmer here at the West Vancouver Memorial Library. On behalf of the library and the West Vancouver Art Museum, I would like to welcome you to tonight's Art Talk. While I recognize that we are all in different places this evening, I would like to acknowledge that the West Vancouver Library and Art Museum reside within the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Squamish Nation, Tsleil-Waututh Nation, and Musqueam Nation. We recognize and respect them as nations in their territory, as well as their connection to the lands and waters around us since time immemorial. It has been my great pleasure to work with Alison Powell and her guests tonight to bring this event to your screens. And now I'd like to pass things over to Allison, who's waiting for us over at the museum. Allison? Thank you, Taryn, and good evening. Thank you, everyone, for joining us um, for this artist talk. My name is Allison Powell, and I'm the assistant curator at the West Vancouver Art Museum. And I am pleased to introduce you Maya Rodrigo Abdi is an emerging art historian, curator, and artist from North Vancouver. She is currently in the process of completing her Master's of Arts degree in Critical and Curatorial Studies at the University of British Columbia. And Rosalind Sadagiani is an artist from West Vancouver who recently graduated from the University of British Columbia with her BFA in Visual Arts and Psychology. In her practice, she traces the genealogy of mass-produced materials. Kiana Shania is an emerging visual artist based in North Shore, Vancouver, with a primary focus on oil panel paintings as a recent graduate of the University of British Columbia with a double major in visual arts and art history. Her artistic practice is situated within liminal and Eurocentric histories, influenced by narratives that have determined what art is, how it is produced, who should view it, and what the viewer should gain from engaging with it. Um, thank you all for joining us today and I will pass the mic on to Maya. Um, as the curator of Who's Your Daddy, I started this exhibit by asking Rosalind and Kiana to join the show to include their works in it. Rosalind already had a work beforehand and Kiana um, had a work commission for the show. Um, so as we start, ladies, both of you were asked by me to get involved in the show last year. Kiana, you were asked to create a new work. Rosalind, you were asked to include a previous work of yours. Um, and it was the preface and premise was to have your works be included in the North Shore because we all have grown up in the North Shore. Um, so do you have any initial thoughts you want to share about the exhibition before we get into like deep dive questions um, and like how you or your work relates to exhibition themes? Yeah, um, for sure. I think like coming into this exhibition um, with the previous work, I would say that my perspectives have kind of like changed a lot um, before. Like I, it was just kind of like a standalone piece, um, but kind of like in the context of the exhibition, I think it kind of became part of a broader dialogue, um, which was interesting to see. And it kind of made me think more, I guess, deeply about like the, um, the different like patriarchal figures involved in like the creation and like, con like conception of the filters um, and like, I guess like the relationship um, with the filters to the North Shore in general. Um, yeah, and I guess going off of that, in contrast to Rosin's, my work was made for the exhibition. So the pro production of it was heavily influenced by the theme of Who's Your Daddy? And um, I guess the constant dialogue that surrounded the notion of these paternal figures that are manifested through objects and geographies. Um, and yeah, so in the relation to the piece and like also knowing that the piece was going to be displayed within um, and like surrounded by the uh, West Vancouver Art Museum's historic objects kind of really influenced how it was gonna look and like, you know, being displayed in the house of a daughter. Uh, it really influenced the outcome and the production of the piece because I kind of decided to explore Who's Your Daddy um, through the narrative of accumulation and consumption mm -hmm. and taking a more, I guess, individual approach to the construction of it. Yeah, that's great. No, like, no, yes, yes, yes. And uh, thinking about Mr. Lube and actual dads is like two different ends of the spectrum for this exhibit. So yes, 
we've, we've done that. But like, how do you feel about having your work situated within this exhibition that deals with the West Vancouver Art Museum's historical object and fine art collections? Kiana, you talked a little bit about it when you said how your work was situated within the historical objects, but like, feel free to jump in either of you. Yeah, I mean, for me, I would say it was like a very wonderful experience to be able to like kind of go through the objects and like look at them up close, um, especially since like I already have kind of interests in like things that like we wouldn't like necessarily consider to um, be kind of like artifacts or like um, different like hidden histories or things that were kind of like um, lost or forgotten in a way. Um, and I also appreciate how mundane I think that these objects were but also like um I think like uh your career your curation Maya kind of like put them into the context of like these broader issues like kind of, like kind of pertaining to like the institution and like the place of the daughter um and then like and thinking about that like with my work um it was it, I, I think it was really it was really great and it was I I really kind of like believe in having like a very embodied experience like with artworks and also like um with objects and like it was great that like this exhibition kind of allows like the viewers to get very up close with like these north shore artifacts in a way mm -hmm. yeah, um you know you have like your own north shore artifacts that you bring into this as well which i mean rosin so do you but like kiana you create a representation of it yeah so um you know, as someone kind of as Rosin said, I'm like very passionate about history and artifacts and like being able to not only see these local artifacts of uh, the North Shore, but and also being becoming a part of their narrative as well. It's such it's been such a pleasure. And, you know, I kind of see art in a sense as this linear narrative, I guess, um, that everything produced is always in relation to what came before it in a sense. Um, so I kind of which is something that I tend to like embrace in my own practice as well. And I think like Maya, you've done such like a great job in this sense of um, creating a, I guess a cr cross period um, curation of this exhibition and kind of, uh, <laughs> kind of um, bringing that notion of a continuity of the past that is carried out through the present in such like a beautiful way. Oh, Kiana, you're flattering me. I don't know what to say. I feel like I okay, Kiana. Okay, let's do a deep dive. Let's go into the works. Let's not like flatter me too much. It's not creator a star. You're the stars of the show. My artists, um, Kiana, you created the installation painting Arma Christi specifically for the show, as we have discussed ad nauseum at this point. And it's a stunning painting situated with an antique cabinet. So can you walk us through a little bit of your artistic process and coming up the concept of the work? Thank you. And yeah, for sure. Um, so since I guess the beginning of the project, when it was proposed, I knew that I kind of wanted to take the approach of um, objects and their collections, um, especially, you know, knowing about the artifacts that were going to be um, placed in it. Um, so I kind of like, you know, began brainstorming this dialogue through, I guess, looking at Cabinets of Curiosities, as I kind of tend to start my projects with the structure that's going to be painted on and like with the form that's going to be used um, before like going into what's going to be painted on it. And so then, you know, I got the cabinet and then there came the question of what was I going to be painting on it? And then I remember like Maya, when me and you went to the uh, gallery to go through the historic objects and like that action of like opening the boxes and taking out these artifacts really like um, reminded me of like when I was young, like back home, um, you know, my dad is a bit of a hoarder. So he has these boxes that are like filled with like random objects that he's collected over like 30 years. Um, you know, things like... Uh, like chocolate wrappers to like the bullets from the Iran Iraq war. war. Um, so yeah, every year I would like kind of get them to bring them down during spring cleaning and like spend a day looking through them. So then that kind of inspired me kind of um, bring these mundane objects together and um, kind of depict them in this uh, still life way and memorialize them. Uh, so then these are, 
forgettable objects in a way gain the significance through their collection. So I kind of gathered or like tried to gather as many objects as I could that have survived this immigration 11 years ago and kind of combine them with the objects that have been added to the collection since then and kind of create my own, um, I guess, curation of artifacts, kind of mirroring what you have done in the second gallery. Um, and yeah, I guess like the, yeah, the Christian imagery and aesthetic of it comes from, I guess, personal interest in that art history aspect and like that period and the art produced for um, the Christian uh, imagery. And I guess, um, through using this aesthetic association, I projected the notion of divinity and like holiness that was then um, placed onto these objects. Yeah, no, it's okay. I remember in the summer when you came in and looked at it, looked at all the like different like objects that me and Allison had gone into the little like the annex at the back of the gallery, um, where everything is stored, all the historical objects. Um, and um we had picked some selections and not everything made it into the show. And so it's like interesting to think about like the things that aren't in the show that inspired your work and then also like how you mimic West Vancouver's own archival collection um in the historical object collection um and that like accumulation over time and like your own family home and like your own family system so yeah I mean like yeah mm -hmm. it's so cool to think about how we've gotten here I'm obsessed i and Rosalind you like by going into the Mr. Lubin tires like created your own collection itself which you had for like a couple of years now um and like displayed in different time periods so your work 75 car oil filters collected on november 28 2021 around 2 p.m from recycling bin at the back of mr lube 1790 marine drive north vancouver bc vcp 1v2 a very lengthy title documenting everything about the the dates um is an installation work with oil filters from that local oil change service store um so it functions as a different type of collection or accumulation um that you kind of bring into the gallery i'm looking at it right now it's kind of i've heard that it's like people at the opening thought it was like a ready-made type 60s sculpture so that was an interesting take on it um and it is ready-made in some ways but it's also a collection that you have that you're kind of putting on display and a medium in your own work so how did this work come to be and can you tell us a little bit more about that history of that historical object collection of yours yeah yeah for sure um i i kind of i think when i start at artwork i usually kind of look at the past and like it's usually a continuation of something I've done before um so when I originally collected the filters it wasn't uh, it was not my intention to kind of create this piece I actually collected them for uh to, to use the remaining remaining oil inside of it as a painting medium for a painting titled the itch scratch cycle which but yeah like after the completion of that work I kind of I felt like there was more to the filters um I I really just like, I don't know, I kind of became obsessed with them. I started researching them. Um, I kind of started by uh, putting them into like a spreadsheet and like um, naming each individual, like what company are they from? Like what's their barcode? Like what can I get from like searching up this barcode? Um, and then from there I began kind of creating, I guess, a lineage of them. I like, I, I created like these kind of like maps of like, these companies and then you'll see that they had like a parent company and then who owns that and like kind of going you know further and uh further back I guess um and that's kind of like how the initial work came to be it was kind of like it was a big kind of research project um and I wanted to display them in a way that like you you get really up close with like an object that is I mean it's so common like they're like filters are kind of like everywhere and like um we are reliant on them for transportation um at in the present day um and so yeah I, I had displayed them two times before who's your daddy um and it's been very interesting to see just how much oil there is in them like there I think it's been like three like two like over two years I would say that like I collected the original filters um and they're still leaking um 
and it's yeah it's it's been really interesting to see how it's just like continually like leaking and like this research has kind of like developed even um within who's your daddy looking more into like mr lube and such yeah that's so cool. no like that was i that was a lot of question and you gave me lots of answers like this <laughs> is correct like i feel like I don't know it just makes me like that idea that they're still leaking after you've like collected them for so long and then also displayed them is like so interesting to think about and also I don't know yeah like just the way you talk about oil and your practice and how it's used as a medium for you is so interesting so like I don't know the reparative like like how to repair something and also like how it's like indicative of like an ongoing issue that can't be resolved I guess like not to like I don't know just all of the different ways you talk about oil is so interesting to me so please tell us a little bit more yeah if, thank you yeah. um I think I mean like I think I kind of use the term oil kind of broadly like I mentioned that in the previous work I used petroleum jelly um but I've also used um walnut oil and also like kind of more traditional linseed oils with oil painting um and like I, I kind of I guess started out with oil painting like that's where my original interest in oil began and I was experimenting with um using oil paints on uh like raw canvas um which has this very like beautiful and like kind of corporeal effect over time like the oil will like separate from the pigment and then like it spreads out and creates kind of like this halo like um around the painting um in a way and then it also has like a very like physical and like bodily effect on like the canvas structure where like the canvas structure like the wood will start to like bend and curve over time and it becomes like very like wonky um so yeah, like, I guess like oil has this like very like unpredictable, uncontrollable quality to it. Like it's very slippery. It does not want to be contained. Um, and it's also like, it, it creates like such a, a, such a, it's a very messy medium and like, it, it's very hard to clean up. Um, so I've thought about this mess and like the, these kind of like physical qualities of oil kind of like both on a metaphor, metaphorical level, but also in its like physicality um and thinking about like how oil kind of like seeps its way into our lives in like different ways um I think like yeah it's a very it's a very heavy medium it has like I think it has a lot of like very beautiful physical qualities that like I really like playing with um but there's also so much like history and stories that like I've been interested in exploring throughout my practice yeah I love the way you talk about it I know it's just such an interesting like deep dive into the medium and like I don't know I've never heard anyone talk about oil like this before and it always I don't know I get inspired every time I hear you talk about it um Kiana you painted your work in actual oil paint and you usually paint on wood panels rather than the typical canvas and I just like I don't know you can talk about oil paint but I also know that like wood panel like painting is like important to your practice as well so like tell us a little bit about when you started working with any of the mediums that you used in your work and also wood panel specifically yeah so um I guess I started working on wood panels around like three years ago and it was mostly inspired and like I was kind of intrigued by like you know learning in art history about all these like old masters that like paint oil on wood panels and I kind of wanted to like try it out and see what it's like. So then one day I just like grabbed a piece of wood and started painting on it. And then I never went back to canvas again. <laughs> and I guess like oil on panel paintings itself is such like a historically charged medium um, associated with like, or I guess um, called high art. And, um, you know, it holds a lot of history within art history so then kind of having the medium itself it kind of puts my work um within this narrative of um painting and its history and I guess wood in general um or specifically uh it's kind of uh and like having experienced woodworking it kind of opened a lot of doors for me and allowed me to create a lot of more elaborate um, surfaces to paint on um so then it kind of 
puts my work away from like the traditional canvas painting of like an image on a flat surface surface and gives like um I guess aspects of sculpture and architecture to my pieces um through the interactivity and the mobility that is made possible by the sense of play and pliability that wood is able to offer yeah yeah it's like got many different pieces to it and like parts and like my eyes go to like you on the side and then you on the other <laughs> side and then all of the stuff in the middle and then the carpet at the bottom and it's just yes the sense of play is very much there and in that it's like all of the wood panels are contained within like the cabinet and so like if you could speak also to like what is the significance of the cabinet in your work and it kind of acts as both a part of the work itself but also as like a container I guess which is interesting when you think about like all of your influences for the work as well so yeah if you can speak to that uh yes yeah, so the cabinet um I guess in the very shape and form of it it's very similar and it hints to like these Christian altarpiece um, reliquaries like these boxes that used to hold um, or I guess they might still exist um, uh, kind of remnants and like remains of holy sites and holy people for worship like shoes hair dirt bits of clothes clothes and um, bones and it's also I guess important to note that the cabinet itself like what it's holding and like the imagery is recycled from um a thrift store here in north vancouver so in that sense it also is in dialogue with um everything that is depicted within it um and yeah so in a sense like the cabinet is still functioning in based on its original um purpose which is like displaying of objects and in a sense also refers back to how these objects were kept in boxes um, that my dad originally put them in. But then again, um, through its uh, visual uh, kind of similarity to these um, sacred objects and um, containers, it kind of uh, glorifies these objects and turns them into venetrated kind of relics and objects that are worth of worship now so it kind of has that duality that yeah as you said is a part of the work but it also adds to the work and contains it I love how you draw upon your like art historical background and then simultaneously I'm like yeah we got it from a North Vancouver thrift store like urban repurpose like this is a shout out to you like we, <laughs> we drove down to park and sulfur and you collected it and you spotted it and you're like no that's it this is the cabinet immediately clocked like yes the memory is flooding back um but yes the art history involved in this is also like I don't know yeah everything okay Let's move a little bit over to Roslyn. Again, you describe your practice as one that traces the genealogies of mass-produced materials. And while Kiana has um, an art historical background, how do you think your research-based background informs your practice? Yeah, I mean, for me, I guess like the research and like my practice and the artwork, they're all very like intertwined, if not, the same thing um and I've I guess like I've kind of always been thinking about like you know where things come from and stuff in my practice and I'm very interested in like the very kind of like overwhelming scale of like production and like especially in this very like cosmic horror like Lovecraftian kind of sense like I think like through the like process of like researching an object like like a filter um or even like I've done like ceiling ceiling panels in the past. Um, I've become very like aware of uh, I guess like the magnitude of this production, which is something that I don't think that we as humans like were like could are we're made to grasp um, just because it's like so out of our kind of like concept of like you know how how many things there can be. Um, so yeah, so I've become very kind of aware of that and also um how I guess like disconnected we are from these processes like we don't usually in our day-to-day -day lives like question like where does something come from like how does it come into our possession like we kind of just accept the fact that like 
you know, like I have this phone or like, um, you know, we don't think about like the different parts of a car where they come from or um, all these like little kind of like things. Um, and like kind of like under this like economic structure we're living in, like uh, like the processes of like production and like extraction and recycling, I think that they kind of become hidden and like we don't, there's so much like unseen labor that um, we're not, I guess like many of us have the privilege to not think about, right? Um, so I often describe like the objects in my practice as like omnipresent entities um, that are kind of like the witnesses to this process. Um, and like, yeah, I mean, like in my in my research, like I I think like and in making an artwork, I really like to bring out like the sensory qualities of the object. And that's part of like the research is being able to have like um, viewers of my work have a very like up close interaction with like objects that we normally won't come into contact with or like we don't think about in this way, but they're, you know, we're surrounded with. Yeah, like getting that background information on unseen like processes and unseen labor and unseen lineages is so important and like so um just like relevant to work but then relevant to like how we look at art in general so like yeah it's it, I feel like we're so grateful to have your work in the show and like it also is not just the filters there's also an accompanying booklet that like demonstrates and documents your research that viewers can flip through on a little plinth beside the sculpture or installation it's an installation I don't know the impact of someone saying it was a sculpture I mean it is sculptural but also I don't know this is separate but why <laughs> have you chosen to display this booklet with the filters does it tie into those like importance of like documenting um unseen things part of your yeah practice? I mean like when I was researching I I mean I was really thinking about like how should I display these filters like how much information do I give? Um, and like, uh, that was, uh, I was really thinking about, about that. Um, but I think in like the process of like researching the filters, I, I spent a lot of time kind of going through like different, like automotive manufacturer, like websites or like, um, info booklets or like different PDFs. Um, and I kind of realized that there's like certain aesthetics that kind of like pop up when you're going through these things. And like, they were usually like very minimal, they were grid like, which like also informed like how I presented the filters. But I think like the kind of organization, like it was kind of like a deceptive, deceptively organized aesthetic that I kind of found to be confusing um, and like almost like propagandic. And maybe that was just because the, they're not meant for me, but like that's just kind of how I felt about them. Um, but yeah, I wanted to like provide, I guess, my audience with like like little bits of information, but also like being able to mimic this kind of like inaccessible and like obscured layers of like bureaucracy and then like these like corporate aesthetics that kind of like, I don't know, they seem to be like hiding something in a way. No, exactly correct. I like how you refer to that um kind of like hierarchy of corporations and the methods in which they like delineate information by not delineating clear information but also has like I don't know very pretty pictures of the filters as well kind of flipped through as like that's the main body of it so visualizing some parts of it but then all of the like little like spreadsheet information is very hard to decipher um so referring to that is like a very like important part of your work thank you for sharing Kiana you also have a reference to um, not the same type of corporate um, industrial complex, but you do reference Christianity in the title of your work. So Arma Christi can be translated into instruments of the passion or weapons of Christ, whichever you prefer. Um, and so do you mind speaking a little bit more into why you chose to title your work with this reference? Yeah, so... Um... I guess I came across like the term Arma Christi while I was doing research on reliquaries and just like these Christian objects of holiness, like how objects become holy in a sense. And yeah, as you mentioned, Arma Christi kind of refers to the collection of the sacred objects associated with the passion and crucifixion of Christ. Um, objects like um, the nails, the hammers, the cross, the whip, 
and like all these tools that were used during his crucifixion. And, um, you know, these are all like very ordinary tools that have only gained this um, kind of profound significance when they became associated with um, this specific figure of Christ. And um, I guess this assemblage is probably also one of like the most significant examples of like material culture and material associations and consumption in a sense that value is being given through, um, I guess, relation or, or geographical associations. Um, and then similarly, the objects that I have depicted in the painting only become significant because they have been collected, because they have been, um, I guess, um, moved away and then rediscovered and placed in a still life to be painted and then memorialized within the painting. So I guess by kind of using that as a title, I was hoping to provide the audience with kind of a point of departure or like, um, yeah, a sense of connection as like a hint of where to begin uh, navigating what my piece is about. And yeah. Yeah, I feel like that's such a key part of your work that it's not just a collection of objects, but like your intervention into that collection of objects and how you have arranged it and rearranged it and then rearranged it again to get the like perfect still life that you want. Um, and also just, I don't know, it ties in with the themes of your practice about um, that you like describe as like offering your audience with a modified representation of what you what has already been done and already been seen. Um, and so like, we've talked about art history a bit, but like, just if you wanted to speak a little bit more, how does your art historical background inform the specific work and your practice as a whole? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so with my art history background, I guess I kind of come to frame my visual practice um, with a lot of art historical research and kind of an awareness of tradition, which I bring into my works, but then I tend to bend it in ways that are either unconventional or just ways that are more contemporary in a sense, I guess. Um, so this kind of appears through my work manifested, as I said before, through the forms, the imageries, the theories that I kind of um, borrow from, are borrowed from like a range of um, periods and geographies, you know, going from, I've used like Persian manuscripts to like um, 19th century French paintings. So in the case of Arma Christi, I guess, it was manifested through the reimagining and kind of reconstructing this 12th century, like, Netherlandish um, altarpieces within kind of this repurposed antique cabinet. And then within the cabinet, I've uh, kind of replaced, or like the accumulation that I have depicted replaces what would have originally been taken the spot of the center panel, which would be like the classic um, icon type of Madonna and Christ. And then on the two doors that would have usually been like the portraits of the sacred, uh, or sorry, the portrait of like the saints or patrons in devotion is now like the image of my own um, worship in a sense. Um, so yeah, it kind of, I guess it could be said that I, my productions are historical reenactments where I kind of insert a contemporary narrative within a more historically familiar compositions in a way. Can you speak also a little bit more to like what the significance of going through the process of collecting the filters from Mr. Lou and like the site specificity of your work to North Vancouver from the perspective of someone that lives in West Vancouver? Yeah, definitely. I I think like when I start a work, I kind of think about like objects, materials or places that like I will often encounter and have a kind of like ongoing relationship with. Um, so like this Mr. Loop in particular was, uh, it's like the oil chain shop my family would normally go to for kind of as long as I can remember. So I don't like, it wasn't really a question of like, um, where I would source the filters to me, it kind of just seemed innate that like, you know, this is where my family went to and like this, it, 
like I we have this kind of like ongoing relationship um with this particular shop um and yeah I guess like it's yeah oil transportation and like you know processes of recycling it's not something that I really thought about before um and it's not like it's a process that's not exactly hidden from us but it's also not one that we like thought about a lot and it's like I think yeah a lot of it is happening in um I don't think there's that many car oil shops in West Vancouver um that I can think of and I guess like the closest one to me was the one in North Van. Um, and it's been really like, yeah, interesting being able to like see all these processes of recycling, which like is also happening in North Vancouver. Yeah, that long like strip of Marine Drive that's like car shops and then like Mr. Loop and like very car related, but also like, yeah, there, there's a lot, yeah, very much so. West Van has a different vibe on Marine Drive. It's a little more curated, if you could say. Um, yeah. Rosalind, you were born here. Kiana, you immigrated here when you were 12. How are both of your artistic practices informed by your current locality to this place, as well as your specific relationships to places that are not here, but could be in the future? Yeah, I mean, like, as I kind of just mentioned, like, I, I am very informed by, like, the objects and places that I have a kind of relationship with um and I think kind of being in the Iranian diaspora and growing up here I I use art to kind of reconnect um with these localities and with my communities um and I and, and like in the process of like making art I've been able to have very um meaningful conversations both with my parents and also um with you and um like you Maya and Kiana um and I think Kind of whether I intend it or I don't like my practice is always kind of informed by my subject position um and I think like in dealing with like objects that themselves they're displaced hidden and like forgotten in many ways um I guess my practice is always um continually tracing and locating um in terms of like plans to move away I don't have anything set in stone at the moment, um, but it's definitely something I'm thinking about. And I definitely like to kind of like broaden my perspectives um, in ways, um, but also I have like kind of a growing appreciation, I guess, for the art scene over here. Um, but yeah, it's on the table. What about you, Kiana? Um, yeah, so me on the other hand, I'm like kind of the opposite. I personally don't really tend to use my subject position a lot within my artistic productions. Um, I guess like Arma Christi, it could be said that it was one of the most personal works that I've made thus far. Um, but then growing up in North Vancouver and kind of surrounded by a significant Iranian population, I've kind of been navigating a complex, in a sense, like interplay of this constructed sense of belonging and a shared experience of displacement. Um, so then I've kind of been taking this duality of longing for a place, but I'm pushing it away um, and kind of been recently experimenting with um, kind of bringing in and incorporating the rich visual culture of Iran into my artworks that could be said are like more influenced by a more western vocabulary and a western perspective of art and history um yeah and yeah. in terms of i guess moving other places um not really sure like as since i've already experienced that moving of immigration is something that i kind of look at with caution in a way but at the same time you know um, obviously would like to experience growth of both artistically and personally in other places, but nothing set in stone yet. So this is all part of growing up and getting older. We're not sure where we are. This curatorial process and artistic process that we all share together over the past year, especially in the summer months where we kind of tested out the waters of spending time around different places in the North Shore, like John Lawson Park, um, the 7-Eleven in West Vancouver, Grandma Lou Hot Pot um, in Burnaby, um, all these different places. 
um, going back to UBC campus when maybe we didn't want to or shouldn't, or maybe we're almost done with it and like it's almost over. Um, but uh, so we spent all this time in different places and discussing our relationships with daddy-like figures and the passing of time from our respective subject positions as daughters situated in this space. Um, it's been very lovely to hear all of the different things about your work. It was very lovely to work with you on this project. And thank you so much for being here and talking about your practice and your work today. Thank you. It was such a pleasure being part of this with everyone involved. And thank you all so much for um, sharing your life and work. Um, I would like to mention that uh, Who's Your Daddy has a publication that's for sale through our bookstore at the West Vancouver Art Museum. Um, please join us from Tuesday to Saturday from 11 a.m. to 5 p.m. to uh, see this amazing exhibition. Thank you.